I'm going to read uh, just a few verses, and I am going to continue this this evening because we're going to work through the whole uh, experience and ministry of Elijah. This morning I'm going to read from uh, chapter 18, the first uh, uh, few verses really. It reads this way, After a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now, the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab had summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of his palace. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. While Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, fifty in each, and had supplied them with food and water. Ahab had said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we will not have to kill any of the animals. So they divided the land they were to cover, Ahab going in one direction and Obadiah in another. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word and its sustaining power and the absolute wonder that it would speak to us in the 21st century from the life of a man who lived more than 3,000 years ago, and yet, O oh God, from his life and its history, the application that encourages us and helps us. This morning, our God, we do remember some of our more senior members full of years and their illness this morning or lack of health. We ask, O oh God, that you would be near to them. I think, Lord, of Ruth Montez. I think of Clarence Roberts. And I think of Patty. And I ask, O oh God, that they would know the comfort and the strength of your presence with them in their homes. And Lord, for the others this morning who are making the most of the weekend, we thank you for them. We thank you for their faithfulness throughout the year, and we're glad that they, with their children, have an opportunity to be together for a few days. Bless them, Lord, as you bless us, for we ask it in the name of Christ, the Lord, that Saviour. Amen. I just want to make a few observations um, this morning. And uh, the first observation concerns that phrase in the opening part of verse 1 where we read, After a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And uh, you read that, and you know, I don't know what you were thinking when you were following along, but it gives us a very significant detail because it highlights something that is really, really important in the life of a believer as believers make progress in their growth with the Lord. And, and, and that is the grace of spiritual patience. It's a grace. It's a gift. The spiritual grace of patience. Every believer needs that grace. Now, I ask you to put yourself in Elijah's sandals. And once you've tried them on for size, ask yourself, really, ask yourself, what would have been the most difficult thing for him to cope with at this particular time? I'll give you just a moment to, to think your thoughts, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are. What do you think was on his mind? And, and I suggest to you that a servant of God who is so undoubtedly full of holy seal as Elijah was, well, I'm going to suggest that the single most difficult thing was simply to sit tight and not doing all those things that his natural instincts prompted him to do. It must have been something like, you know the frustration that a sidelined athlete feels as he or she sits in the dugout watching the, others, the other players play the game, 
while his or her greatest desire is to get on the field and to win the game. It must be frustrating. And when they show you these people on the bench, you see them. And you know, they're chomping on the bit to get out and play. And so to be forced into inactivity must have been very frustrating. It must have been very trying for Elijah. Because within himself, he was all revved up, and like us, he was ready to go. He was ready for the drought to be over and to go before King Ahab and, you know, let him have what for. Yet the Lord kept him sitting on the sidelines, away from the action, day after day, week after week, and year after year. And if that proves nothing else, it proves that God's timing is not our timing. And can't we agree? Yet, as in all things, God's way is always best. Now, at the time, you think, my goodness me, why isn't God doing something with me? Why isn't he opening up a door or whatever? But God always knows best. And with hindsight, we can attest to that. Patience is frustrating. But it's never wasted. Because the years spent by Elijah at Kareth and Seraphath were years of precious preparation and molding. For it was during those years he learned the faithfulness and he learned the sufficiency of God's word. When God said something to him, he could believe it and take it to the bank. And he learned the absolute trustworthiness of God. And it was during those years that he was actually equipped for the climax of his ministry. Because the God's honest truth is, without Kareth and Seraphath, there would have been no Mount Carmel. And what a message here for any zealous Christian who feels sidelined or who feels displaced from the service he or she so earnestly desires. You know, it's not impossible that there's someone even in this little group, in this little room, just now. And he or she is all wound up and ready to go. Your every fiber, every sinew is chomping at the bit to get up and get at it. But you have to sit back. And it's like watching time slip through your fingers. I think we all know that experience, don't we? I knew that, my exp uh, that experience myself. Because the God's honest truth is the morning of my conversion, when I was called to Jesus Christ, was also the time of my call to ministry. When I came to faith in Jesus, I, I didn't want to, to go to church three times on Sunday and come to the prayer meeting and read my Bible every day. and that kind. I wanted to do all that, but I actually f experienced a call to Christian ministry. But yet I had to wait four years. Four years before the Lord opened the way to university and seminary. And then after seminary, it was most, most frustrating because I had to go to a tiny Baptist church in a very small town in Northern Ireland where there were as many Baptists as you could count in both hands. And what made it worse, I was with two other graduating seminarians and, and I had to be there before I could get into solo ministry. And I tell you, it almost drove me crazy because I was concerned that Jesus would come before I got a chance to get busy in church ministry. I know I shall always remember Mrs. Murphy's words week after week at the prayer meeting. Dear Lord, we know that waiting time is not wasted time. I didn't see it that way. But time would show that Mrs. Murphy was spot on. And Elijah's time was certainly not wasted time. It was the very time of fitting, without which the highest point of his ministry could never have come. 
And to make the pain of waiting vivid, look at the first phrase of verse 1. And in my NIV, which I read to you, the New International Version, it reads, after a long time. And that means literally, after many days. You see, the Spirit of God invests much detail to teach us important lessons. And what he's teaching us is that life isn't measured in years. It's so precious, it's measured in days. Yes, patience is a tedious thing, but it is a necessary thing. And when we are learning patience, take it from me, and I know that you can say amen with me. Time isn't something that flies when you've got to be patient. And patience is measured in days, never years. It's that old lesson of life again. We've got to live it one day at a time. And God is saying to us, measure your life by days. Just like old Job said, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. You remember Joseph, when asked by Pharaoh how old he was, he said, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130. And so I say to myself, wise and well are those Christians who are able to say, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Brothers and sisters, I don't know where you are in life right now, and there's very few people, if any, around you who know. But I do know that God cannot be hurried. I don't want to hurt you or shock you, but he'll not be hurried by our performance. No matter how we act out before him, no matter what a display we put on before him as to the desires of our hearts, he'll not be hurried. And he'll not be hurried by our prayers either. Isn't that amazing? We've got to sit tight at times and be patient. We've got to wait for his appointed time. And when God's clock strikes, it's never one moment early or one moment late. The God who said to Elijah in chapter 17, who said, leave here and go to Kareth, and then leave Kareth and go to Zarephath. Uh, uh, now after three years, he says, go present yourself to Ahab. And brothers and sisters, that's my first observation and application. The grace of spiritual patience is always necessary in the life of a believer. So often in our Christian life, we want to hop into the helicopter. You know, we get converted, we get saved, we are regenerated by the Spirit of God. We want to get into the helicopter and fly out of the valley and get up on the mountaintop. Oh, I remember my grandfather speaking to me on one occasion. I was very impatient, not to say I'm any less now. But he told me this little story. He said there was this guy and he was stood at the top of a mountain by the source of a spring. And he took a jagged rock and he was told to throw it from the mountaintop down into the bottom of the stream in the valley. And he did. And it landed there at the bottom in the stream. Then he said, now take another stone just as jagged and drop it in the stream. And then a long time later, the man was directed to go to the bottom of the stream as it entered the valley and told to pick out the stone that you threw from the top of the mountain. And he did, and he picked it out. And there it was, with all its jagged edges still there, Nothing had changed. Then he said, pick out the one you dropped into the flow of the stream. And he did. And it was round and smooth. All the jagged edges had been knocked off. 
as it was carried downstream by that stream and it bumped against rock and against stone and against rock. <coughs> That's the way life is. That's the way Christian life is. You can't jump into the helicopter and go to the top. My second observation is, to say the least, ironic. Because in the first observation, I was empathizing with Elijah and those like him who find themselves sidelined for a time and needing the grace of patience. Now, just for a moment, in contrast, think of the difficulty now when he was called to go. He was chomping at the teeth, wanting to go. Three years have passed. The word of God comes to him. Now, get up and go. Let's remember Elijah had been living in this widow's home along with her son and possibly others for quite some time. And I think if you're a real human being, as, as Elijah was, the widow and her son likely had become almost family for Elijah. They had faced some very trying times and days together. There were bonds and ties that were made over the years that wouldn't be easily broken. And whether we like it or not, Seraphath had become his home. And now after all this time, Elijah's marching orders have come from God. And that sets up quite a contrast. Let's remember why Elijah was being directed to leave the fellowship and the friendship and the safety of that family in their home. You've got to remember this. It was to go and face the most evil and murderous king who for three years had identified Elijah as the most wanted man in Israel. He was waiting to get his hands around Elijah's neck and believe me, it wasn't to embrace him. Now would you have wanted to leave that family in the safety of that home so as to confront Ahab? I mean, be honest. Oh, I know, you'd have got on your bicycle and left yesterday. Yet the God who said, go hide yourself, now says, go show yourself. And here again is the measure of a man who is just like us. I say just like us in that he was, ju he was just an ordinary guy. He wasn't a superman. And the record states... So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Could there be some application here for someone in this room? Maybe like Elijah, you're settled in where you are and, and what you're doing or what you're not doing. And I add this because this is what we're talking about for the service of the Lord. You're settled in and you're enjoying the Lord's work and the part that you're playing or what you're not doing. And then the Lord summons you into his service for something else. And maybe your life is as settled and as comfortable as you want it to be. You're happy with your lot and you're not seeking any change. But who knows? Perhaps God is asking you to leave the comfort of your safe spot and plunge into something very different and very difficult. Underline this, in the service of God. Will you do it? Will you do it? Will you follow the obedience of a person who is just like you and just like me? I'm serious. Let me be specific. Will you join the choir for Easter? Will you let your name go forward because you have a desire and you have a record of faithfulness that you will let your name go forward to be nominated in second for service in Deacon Fellowship? Are you willing to help in the children's work? Are you willing to work within the senior adult group?
or are you content to sit on your best feature in church on Sunday and think, that's all God wants me to do? I hope it isn't. And just as Elijah had done in chapter 17, verse 1, he does it again. Look at verse 15. Elijah says, as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. Not yesterday or today. And for three years, Elijah had to sit tight. Now his marching orders had come and he must get up and go. And so today for each of us, when God calls us to obedience and service, will we hold on to comfort and hold back from obedience? It's true. Oftentimes it can be hard to sit tight. And other times... It can be just as hard to get up and go and serve the Lord. But then, I heard this yesterday. There's a time for everything. And this could be your time. This could be your time. There's one more observation. Look at that phrase in verse 2. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. Now, this is a very sad thing, and don't think it just happened 3,000 years ago, because this shows us something very telling about Ahab. You may well suppose at a time of sore famine that Ahab as king would do all in his power to alleviate the misery of his people. But look at verse 5. Ahab's one and only thought was about losing any of his horses and mules. So what does he do? He commissions a nationwide search for grass for his bloodstock. Can you imagine the inhumanity and the wickedness of this man? This is a record of a ruler 3,000 years ago. Yet this wicked, evil, cruel inhumanity and indifference is alive and well today on an even larger scale. We have rulers who loll about in their vain pleasures and wild excess while being indifferent to the hopeless plight of their starving people. But it's not only rulers. I'm glad you're sitting down. Our own nation, our own nation is plagued with wicked men and women who are corrupted by greed and avarice, who have neither feeling nor qualm about exploiting men, women, children, and animals. Causing degradation and suffering for tens of thousands who are trafficked in the most hideous sexual and labor slavery. In this country, listen, in this city. Hundreds of thousands more in our cities and our suburbs and our rural communities who are addicted to the illegal supply of narcotics. And thousands fatally overdosing on doctored heroin and synthetic drugs. My friends, there was only one Ahab in Israel. We have many, many more in the United States. And we have countless across the globe. Godless, heartless, mindless men and women who have become insanely wealthy and powerful off the misery and death of people whose names they neither know nor care to know. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, could it be that any of us spent more on a dog? A cat? A horse? A garment? A night out? A weekend away? Than we do in support of the Lord's work here and across the world while remaining indifferent to the suffering around us? And the cause of Jesus Christ? 
You know, that is a good question. Brothers and sisters, that's important. And sisters. The sisters are as good as any brother. Let's align ourselves with the courageous and selfless commitment to the service of the Lord that is demonstrated by Elijah. And let's reject the wicked, selfish, greedy ways of Ahab. And let's call out those who live that way. Tell you what, it's time to keep quiet. I got to answer that call. Thank you for listening. There will be more tonight. I'm simply going to follow on. You've had enough. I can see that. Three or four of you have fallen asleep. <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, I was in the church, and our deacons, you know what our deacons had? They had 10 feet poles. <laughs> Seriously, with a little point on the top. And you know what their ministry was? It was to walk up and down the aisles, and if anyone was nodding off, they had this pole. But seriously, though, if there's anyone here who was able to get 40, weeks this 40 winks this morning during service, I'm glad because you must need it. And that is a blessing to you, I'm sure, from God. So remember what the observations were. And we looked at them historically. But the thing is, we have got to note the application to us today. And we've got to carry those applications out in our lives outside. And then if you're able, come back this evening. And you'll hear more. And we'll stick at it until we get to that time when our brother Elijah, that man like us, was taken up to heaven. Aren't you looking forward to that too? Of that time when you too will go to be with the Lord.